Hello and welcome to the Society with Fatma Shaheen at PTB World. A climate change, as we all understand, is the biggest threat which we all face, not only in Pakistan but world over too. Having said that, it is notable, rather, it is very important for us to actually appreciate the fact that when we talk about climate change, despite the fact that Pakistan is not uh, one of its biggest contributors world over, Pakistan is categorized to be one of the most wonderful countries most worstly hit by it which is why when we talk about climate change we must just not talk about it from the lens of an environmental issue we must also look at it socially economically as well as politically how are women how are children how are the less uh, you know affluent uh, classes in our society today affected by it rather more disproportionately affected by it this and much more we'll be talking about in our today's show we'll also be talking about the role of the government, the role of the state, the role of laws, a civil society, media and masses generally when it comes to fighting off climate change. This and much more to follow in today's show and to do that let me introduce you to my today's panel. My first panelist for the show today is Ms. Zara Gilani who is an environmental activist. Salaam alaikum Zara and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on the show. You are most welcome. Uh, my second panelist for the show today is Samil Naseem who is an environmental economist. Salaam alaikum Jean. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Fatma. Good to be here. Thank you for joining us. And my third panelist for the show today is Ms. Mehrun Nessa Sajjad, who is a legal expert alongside being an analyst too. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Zara, I would like to start the show with you. You know, when we talk about uh, climate change, when we talk about uh, uh, air pollution and environment generally, uh, considering that, you know, it's World Environment Day today, too, 5th June, uh, I think it's very important for us to talk about these issues. How do you feel has that level of, you know, actually debating upon these issues, bringing them within the, you know, discourse of discussion changed over a period of time? Because now I see that, you know, a lot of people, especially young people, are more sensitized about it. They they choose to talk about it and not only that they are also very actively looking towards a way forward you know have you seen that uh, climate change is real you know we there's so much talk about it mm. but now we're actually seeing and in the past we've also seen you know great events taking place mm. unprecedented events taking place like forest fires and flooding and you know the heat wave that uh, came to Karachi you know right. 1200 people were down and then you know the uh, the flood that Pakistan was faced with in mm. 2010 uh, one fifth of the country was submerged so talking about Pakistan but internationally you know we've seen forest fires in the wildfires, Arctic, wildfires in the mm. Arctic you know never heard before the oceans are acidifying and you know uh, the uh, ice sheets are melting at a much faster rate than they've ever been before so all of these things you know are actually causing great concern worldwide mm -hmm. and we the scientists have uh, actually told us that you know the the planet is warmer than it was before right. and because of that you know we are you know, this this called this phenomena the global warming you know and uh, everything is being affected everything by it. Everything is being affected that way and I think not only that, I think we are generally experiencing more extreme, more dry climate so to speak. Like even when we have a particular, you know, season, summer, that is more intense, it's more heated like up. Like you've just seen, you know, presently, right. you presently know, we didn't we just have any heat spring, wave, which, exactly. uh, you know, right after winter. We just jumped winter, into the summer we and jumped quite into the hot summer. Intense summer. So, you know, we had planned plantation drives but then, you know, uh, the experts, they told us, they said, okay, you know, uh, let's wait for the monsoon and mm. let's do plantation then because suddenly you know this hot wave summer wave and has taken over to be like heavy monsoons too so again again something which goes back to climate change so i'll come to you know uh, talking about the basics i think she just gave us a general overview how do you differentiate between air pollution and climate change because i think at a very basic level people don't understand that difference I'm so glad that you have brought that up, Fatma, mm. because I think there's a common misconception here right. where people conflate climate change with air pollution. Mm. Though there is a lot of overlap in terms of sources, mm. what contributes to air pollution, some of that also contributes to climate change. Right. Uh, and also in terms of policy, what you're going to do to address air pollution, a lot mm. of that also works to address climate change. But right. these are... In, in, in both the scientific way and in terms of policy, two distinct phenomena. Right. Air pollution is a more localized problem. 
right? Mm -hmm. So Lahore, for example, we have experiences incredibly S hazardous smog. air quality mm -hmm. perennially. It's mm -hmm. almost throughout the year. Right. It's just that it's only in the winters when it becomes visually I more prominent. I think you prominent. can't tolerate it in the winters <laughs> because you know it's out there in your right. face. And year by year, we've seen that it has been on a drastic rise. Right. It has become more toxic. Right. That but way. you'd be shocked to know that even in the summer months, our air quality levels mm. are way beyond our own in our own standards. The mm. standards set by our own environmental protection department mm. and the standards sent, uh, set by the World Health Organization. But why now, does this become more of an issue in winters then? I think you would as somebody who studied environmental science have an right. explanation for that because right. you know I'm looking at it from a layman's right. perspective. Right. Why does it become so noticeable in the winters right. especially? So well the, the, there are two things that happen in the winter months. One is as it becomes cooler mm. we get this weather phenomena called temperature inversion where mm. there is a layer of hot air that gets mm. trapped between a layer of cool air mm. so then there's not a lot of air movement and so you get what we call stale air right mm. and that's where pollute pollution or pollutants start accumulating mm. now what then happens is that during the in the mornings especially the, uh, the, the pollutants in the air, they combine with the dew to form what we call smog, right? Mm. So this is a combination of fog and, and Which uh, is why, pollutants. of course, it's more glaring and in so your you, face you, and visible you start too. visually right. sort of seeing, seeing it. And experiencing right. it too because right. so many people fall sick, yes. more so, especially in the Lahori winters. Absolutely. Sir, coming to you, I think we must also talk about this from a health perspective and, of course, uh, from a social justice perspective too because a lot of times we see that when we talk about, you know, climate change, when we talk about air pollution, noise pollution, water pollution, it's just, you know, a lot of people just categorize it to be an environmental issue, mm. although it's not. We understand the fact that it's also a social justice issue. We also understand the fact that, you know, it can be an economic issue too because, of course, society and economics yeah. go together. And, of course, nobody can deny the fact that it's a political issue too. So how do you draw a link between all these and what do you feel is the most important lens through which we must see it? So I think the idea of like bracketing climate change as a purely environmental issue, it's, it's very dangerous because mm. you see it's not just an environmental issue. Mm. It's a global inequality issue, mm. firstly, right? It is also, I mean, um, in terms of the developed world and developing countries like Pakistan, we are bearing the brunt of climate change much more, having contributed much less right. to, to the problem mm. in the first place. Um, then on a second level, women are mm. much more vulnerable to climate change mm. and are more affected as a group right. also and are more actually susceptible to getting diseases. Right, Merunis. And I think this is exactly why we need to understand that, you know, uh, women, they do unfortunately get disproportionately affected yes. by it, especially when it comes to, you know, climate-induced migration. And this is a problem that we have seen in Sindh as well. Would you like to add something to that? Yes, uh, climate-induced migration is a real phenomena. It's there's a lot of evidence that it's occurring, uh, and, and not just in Pakistan. But this is a worldwide issue. Um, but the, these effects then snowball, right? So there's a bunch of migrants who are mm -hmm. getting displaced because of uh, climate change-induced uh, problems. Mm. Uh, but then they need somewhere to go. Hmm. It's hard to then relocate outside of your uh, national boundaries. Hmm. So a lot of these migrants then start uh, moving towards big urban centers because they see those centers as areas where they hmm. can gain employment or uh, sites of, of uh, engagement or building new homes or new lives. But then the issue is that the way our urban cities and towns have developed, hmm. they are not able to withstand the pressure they can't of increased population. And of course, then right? the demographics, so they also become adversely affected that way. And then so many yeah. other things crop up because then, of course, you have to have those employment opportunities. You have to have so many other things in place in order people to... People not working in people agriculture, not, working not like viable right. for them anymore. Kohistan, you know, the, uh, currently we've seen within Pakistan, mm. a lot of people are migrating because of the drought and mm. lack of food. They're moving with their livestock elsewhere. Mm. So this is within Pakistan, but outside Pakistan, like we've seen in the Sahara, mm. you know, shortage of food and water is pressing people to move and leave their native. Right, and I was reading this report by Oxfam in 2019, which very clearly said that, you know, when it comes to women migrating, uh, there's a heightened exposure of theirs, especially uh, in terms of their vulnerability and sexual harassment too. So I think we must consider this, especially from a gender lens, on which I'll come to you again. I think when we talk about solutions, we must talk 
talk about the fact that you know something which I earlier mentioned in my introduction as well that of course uh, this is a trans boundary kind of a solution just last year you saw that you know a lot of debate was going on in which it was being said that you know India is contributing to our air pollution by of course uh, the burning of the crops there by the farmers so when we talk about solutions how do you feel can we as communities as countries uh, come up with equitable solutions you know solutions which not only suit you but solutions which also do not harm the other countries we have to understand the gravity of the matter and you know what the problem is mm. the you know climate change cr uh, cr climate change crisis is a global issue mm. you know you cannot restrict it within you know geographical boundaries therefore it is important that you know we look at from look at it from that perspective mm. so pakistan the pakistani government has uh, you know taken this initiative that they've uh, started to negotiate with their neighbors mm. so that to build up regional alliances mm. so that we can look at this problem uh, from a global perspective right. uh, because you know a lot of times uh, you know the, the complaint is that the farmers on the other side of punjab mm. the indian side have burnt their uh, right. crops uh, just in the they preparation still burn and, crops they are, and, and they are saying the yeah. same thing about us so and i think it's something which applies actually yeah. both ways yeah. that way so it's not only you know the uh, crop which is uh, you know polluting the air uh, you know it, the other things also like water pollution mm. like when the you know there are throwing pollutants in the waters of river ravi and it's mm. flowing towards pakistan then you know automatically you know uh, the Pakistani waters are, are, are being affected. Of course. So, you know, you cannot restrict it. So you wanted to add something. Yeah, this is a good point uh, uh, on um, transboundary air pollution. Mm. Uh, the you know, crop burning happens on both sides of the Punjab, right? right? So, and then there's this deep mistrust. Mm. Now, India feels that we're, you know, exactly. there's, there's, there's a bunch of, you know, th that there's air pollution that flows from Pakistan into its borders mm. and vice versa. Uh, so, A, there's, of course, there's a lot of room to improve, uh, um, you know, A, we need data to really understand what's going mm. on, but beyond that, we need these two countries to get together and uh, address this issue uh, together mm. uh, because uh, uh, sources uh, in each country contribute to deteriorating air quality right. across each other's borders but I'm just glad you raised this sources right. I think that is so important at a very basic level because you know when we talk about sources a lot of times people just you know think that sources are those which come from transport like if you are actually driving a vehicle which gives out you know heavy emissions that is contributing to air pollution right. a lot of people times people don't understand the fact that you know if you don't have a mindful kind of a lifestyle you can in your own way also contribute right. towards you know uh, climate change and uh, air pollution it's of course a vicious cycle and then of course I think a large part of this whole debate is the responsibility which is vested on industries too so of course as somebody who is an expert in this area how do you compare all these sources and which do you feel needs to be better regulated in right. Pakistan again there's a lot of dearth of data mm. in terms of uh, what are the sources that contribute to mm. uh, both deterioration of air quality and mm. contribution to greenhouse gases mm. uh, there was a st so the the correct way of figuring out mm. who contributes to air pollution figuring out sources of air pollution is what we call source apportionment studies mm. in Pakistan we haven't had a solid source apportionment study done perhaps ever Mm. Um, there was what we call a remote sensing study that was done by the FAO, which is an mm. arm of the United Nations, back in 2018. Mm. And we have some sort of suggest suggestive evidence from that report, which kind of tells us that um, vehicular emissions contribute the most to, to air pollution, mm. or particularly this one pollutant, what you call PM2.5, which is supposed to be the most egregious pollutant. So vehicular emissions are the number one contributor there, followed by industries, mm. uh, and then energy, and then agriculture. Mm. So so that's the order that you would place them in. Well, perhaps, but, but how well the are they regulated? We like yeah. when you look at the system, we do see that people generally, I feel, they've become more aware of climate change. They've become more of the surroundings around them, of environmental issues, so to speak, over a period of time. So do you see that, you know, this level of awareness is actually translating into positive action too? Like, um, of course, I understand the fact that the state has to lay down a certain structure for regulation. But do you not feel that it is also the responsibility of people out there to be mindful towards their surroundings absolutely one way of addressing the issue is that people need to change their behavior hmm. but the scale of the problem hmm. is just so large hmm. that 
individual actions by themselves mm -hmm. are just not going to be enough. Right. Um, it has to be a combination. It has basically. to be. I mean, the scale of the problem is large enough where you need state intervention of or course. policy. Of course, one now, cannot this, deny this, that. This, now, I mean, again, by, by state intervention, I don't necessarily mean that the state becomes all powerful and intervenes. But it has to set a policy. Right? Right. Polluters pollute because the the uh, because of you know the phenomena what we call a com what, what we call a common pool resource. The hmm. air is a common pool resource. Hmm. It's a resource. It's basically it's providing a service. Hmm. It is it's 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 when you as when you drive your car, when you have an industry, when you pollute, hmm. the air acts as a repository for hmm. the waste that you're generating. But right. you're not paying for it. Right. You know, when you're, you're, the, your, your air pollution But you need to have a policy at the end of the day to regulate it, I, which will take me to you. I think policy, he's raised some very valid points on which I would want you to deliberate further. Now, when you look at our system, when you look at our laws, when you look at our judicial judgments, we see that, you know, a lot of climate justice jurisprudence has developed from yes. uh, Pakistani courts, which is, of course, a very welcoming thing. And I think you would also want to contribute to this because you've had that benefit of working with so many, you know, judges that way but when we talk about our laws especially laws which exist on paper mm. so how how do they cover this issue of pollution of environmental issues of climate change so to speak okay so I think um, more effective than laws and policy um, mm. they have been the individual judgments emanating from the high courts and the Supreme Courts which have kind of set um, sort of the development of environmental law in motion in Pakistan um, so speaking about the judgments first, um, this concept of the, the right to life, now mm -hmm. it's, it's given law in Pakistan that the right to life includes the right to a healthy and clean environment. Right. So by denying citizens that, the state is actually denying them their right to life. Mm -hmm. And then we also had in uh, various cases, Askar Ligari, Shaila Zia, Imran Atiwana, this concept of the doctrine of public trust, which is what you just said, right. that it's a, hmm. the air is a natural resource, but hmm. it is one that all of us have collective ownership of. Hmm. And hmm. the state actually has a fiduciary duty, the hmm. court held, to protect this for citizens and of not course. just for citizens who are inhabiting the country or the planet at any given time right now but for mm. future generations as well and we so, have also seen judgments where you know judges have actually asked for implementation of all these policies exactly for commissions to be formed to actually monitor regulation exactly. that but way. you see Fatma the problem is that so we had the renewable energy policy mm. of 2006 under which NEPRA uh, introduced suggested some tariffs lower tariffs for renewable energy but these were not notified um, there's a writ pending in the Lahore High Court right now mm. um, seeking a direction to have these notified but the problem is with each each change in government, mm. um, there's a lot of, it slows down um, sort of any action that is taking place. And then even when the policies exist on paper, uh, we have brilliant policies and research and paperwork on all of this, but implementing them at a grassroots level. I think that's a level, question mark, basically. That's a problem. But I think in this regard, we must also acknowledge the fact that when we talk about, you know, various governments, I think all governments at some level or the other have been serious in taking up this issue of environment in one way or the other, whatever agendas they might have set. And recently we saw that, you know, when the current government came into power, we did see the Prime Minister ordering task force to be formed, uh, you know, to combat climate change. So I think that was a very welcome move to start with and then recently we've also seen the climate change a minister Sherry Rahman Saiba she's been very vocal about this yes issue. her statement where she very rightly highlighted the role that the leading role that developed countries must take in right. ensuring that climate change is being mitigated and of course being the largest emitters and contributors to this problem mm -hmm. I think uh, a, a bigger and heavier onus should be placed on them on the to also countries. assist and uh, developing countries with this both financially and also in terms of lending them expertise in, technology. in terms of technology right. um, research right. all of that so you yeah. know it's very good to see that at least these things are being talked about and a narrative is being set at least from the state level yes. on which I'll come to you I think we must also talk about you know the use of plastic bags because that is a very interesting campaign I understand that you are running uh, basically with people not uh, from now but for quite some yes, time it's been a while it's that, been a while so yeah. tell us more about that you know how did it come about and how successful has it been yeah we uh, we've been pressing the government uh, we've had meetings at the commissioner office Lahore and uh, we've brought up this issue that single-use plastics should be banned and uh, and they have been banned in Lahore yes, at least in the department yes stores, the government did them. take mm. uh, you know strict action and now the leading departmental stores have not kept any plastic bags they are 
paper bags mostly or mm. reusable bags. So we also, at our NGO, we've been promoting environmental friendly products. And we always have straw baskets and cloth bags and you know, reusable bags you know, for, for the people. So th this is a public awareness campaign you know, that we put up to educate the masses mm. because it's very important to spread the awareness regarding climate change. And I think awareness just not in the masses but also I think one good thing that you're doing is that you're also penetrating into educational institution which I think is a very novel kind of an initiative. Yeah, yeah. We've been that too at a primary level. Yes, we've been to primary schools, to senior schools, we've been to universities and conducting uh, presentations, uh, gardening workshops and uh, you know trying to spread awareness at all levels and you've also filed a petition in the lahore high court basically to ban the use of plastic bags yes there was a petition filed in the lahore high court and there was a judgment of the court also which banned the use of single use plastics including styrofoam products etc hmm. um, in punjab hmm. um, and i mean it's a concerted effort like ngos civil society um, lawyers are doing their bit there've also been other petitions filed on um, there was a judgment of the Delhi High Court actually, which uh, made it compulsory mm. for courts to um, use double-sided printing on right. paper to reduce the use of paper. So there's a petition on that pending in the Lahore High Court right now also. So a lot of people through public interest litigation, through legal activism, civil society, and NGOs like And I think people like now are more active than they were ever before. Yeah. And we shall come to you. I think we must also talk about the fact that, you know, policy is something which you earlier spoke about. But when we talk about policy, I think we need to talk about the fact that, you know, what should an ideal policy have? Because like we all, you know, earlier discussed that when we talk about policy we do see that Pakistan to some extent at least has that policy but the problem arises in the implementation but ideally if you were to propose some reform in the current policies that we do have what would that reform be before we speak about policy I think it's important to kind of identify and address misconceptions as I said earlier hmm. on climate change often people talk about how we don't necessarily contribute to greenhouse gas emissions mm. and uh, and they say that in a way where they want to absolve themselves from responsibility mm. or doing something. They're very callous but, about right. it. But the fact is that, look, sure, you're not like a big con contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, mm. but you are you are basically, of you know, w one of the most No, but if you are countries. driving a car which is and giving out smoke that yeah. way, then you are a contributor but, but, in the most simplest right. sense. But also, but the fact is that climate change is going to affect your population quite a bit. And we have... We have projections, we have simulations showing that the Indian subcontinent, especially the area where our country lies, is going to be heavily affected. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, it's already being affected, but given another 50 years or so, things are going to be far more drastic according to these projections, right? right. So we need to think about how do we uh, mitigate these effects hmm. and how do we adapt? I think adaptation is where we need to, to really focus. focus. Right, your point is noted. On which I am coming to you, Zara, I think we must also talk about uh, the policy that you have been working on and you managed to, you know, get it through, you managed to get it incorporated and implemented as well, the urban forest policy I am talking about, the 2019 one. So tell us about it, you know, that what all did it aim to cover and did it actually cover the points that he just mentioned? Yes, uh, the urban forest policy uh, 2019 was a very extensive policy. It mm -hmm. covered a lot of areas and uh, we were more concerned with the civil society engagement. Mm -hmm. So the Honorable Lahore High Court made us a, uh, you know, part of the committee mm -hmm. uh, for deliberations on its subject policy, subject matter. So we suggested quite a few uh, you know, uh, uh, things regarding that policy and they were incorporated mm -hmm. and we were very happy that at the federal level it was accepted and parts of it have been started to be implemented upon last Which year. Which parts particularly? Uh, the plantation we suggested that you know uh, uh, the new housing urban development uh, schemes they should uh, make it mandatory hmm. for a number of trees to be grown in each uh, you know uh, plot right. allocated and uh, you know we said that uh, you know uh, the the urban cities they become heat islands so it's very important for urban forestry hmm. uh, to be focused upon and this needs to be done at a 
primary level into schools uh, blended with education right you know and, and made it mandatory important, a very important yeah. part of this which would be of interest to the audience is that you try to actually engage community in this whole process yes. which is extremely extremely definitely important. definitely and I think this is something which we generally miss you yeah. know um, more often than not Def and I think you would also want to add something to this something which we were earlier discussing as well that you know when we talk about a plantation when we talk about planting trees about you know a forestation a lot of times people uh, feel that you know this is the only way in which we can tackle climate change right. although of course we understand the fact that it is of course not the only way so how do you address that misconception that when we talk about you know tackling climate change through forestation right. what are the other things that we need to you know focus on simultaneously right. too I think the biggest misconception in this in at least in Lahore was that a lot of people thought that creating urban forests mm. was uh, a solution to our air pollution hmm. woes hmm. Uh, but that's not true like the, again hmm. air pollution is just the scale is just so large that planting trees is not going to fix that hmm. if you want to improve air pollution you have to target polluters polluters hmm. have to pollute less that's right. the only way you're going to get less you have to target all the state. sources one by one but urban but but forests urban forests on the other hand when it comes to climate change hmm. is is a adaptation strategy Hmm. Uh, cr cr uh, adding more f urban forests hmm. decreases temperatures hmm. in cities. They, they probably won't cool the entire city, but hmm. will have uh, some effect to a few degrees, which right. is keeping those cities cooler. Hmm. But the other biggest advantage is that as temperatures go up hmm. and staying outside becomes more unbearable, hmm. a lot of people who work outside need shade. Hmm. And now there's enough evidence, uh, experimental evidence, showing that people are far more productive when they get a few hours to, or a few minutes, just to lie in the shade hmm. uh, to regain the strength and their energy. Of course. Uh, so we need these, you know, think of, we're sitting in a very comfortable we studio right now. We need these little, little things. And uh, last year too, I remember, do you remember when different <laughs> citizens, they went all over Lahore and they put in these air quality index monitors just right. to monitor, you know, the air quality uh, in different parts of Lahore. So I think that in itself was a very promising initiative too. I think he's again raised some very valid points that when we talk about tackling this issue, we need to look at it from a more holistic kind yes. of a manner. And I think in this, the industry, the fashion industry, so to speak, has a very important role to play too. So how do you feel uh, can the fashion industry work to actually fight off uh, climate change? Because a lot of times we see that, you know, there's so much that they can possibly do, which unfortunately they don't. And just if they were more, you know, environmental friendly, just if they were more conscious about the way they uh, produced clothes or, you know, other things, maybe we could perhaps, you know, cut down on this issue. Um, so I think there is a growing trend even within Pakistan about sustainable practices within all industries. Mm -hmm. And the fashion industry too, now you see with some clothing brands, they say that this is made from recycled cloth. Right. Um, then you have startups now which um, promote sort of um, allow people to give their designer outfits or wedding clothes for rent, for mm. example, right? If there's an outfit you're going to wear one once or twice, mm. why are you getting a new one made and that kind of thing. So um, I think there is a growing consciousness and mm. awareness around this. And I also think that now, um, not just the fashion industry, but even the local industry, mm. um, you will see, you know, tags on the uh, on the. Uh, packaging which says is it ethically produced uses right. all biodegradable mm. material um, and even some of the shoes I remember buying of yeah. late even they very categorically state that because a lot of brands I see that they've now switched to this as maybe marketing themselves that you know they're different from the others yes. by actually being more environmental friendly that yes way. and I think the reason they are doing that Fatma is because within citizens uh, there is a growing consciousness mm. about this right you will see um, some cafes which are now instead of plastic kind of stirrers mm. or they're using uh, bamboo straws for example right or, you know restaurants are keeping steel straws which mm. are uh, instead of plastic and even straws, some so jewelry is like if you see on online pages even some of the jewelry which is being actually yes. sold that also has that you know element of sustainability in it it is clearly mentioned that you know this is made 
from environmental friendly products. Yes. So coming to, I think in this regard, we must also talk about the fact, the tourism industry. I think the tourism industry also in its own way contributes to pollution. A lot of times we see that, you know, uh, people who visit up north, they actually end up littering, you know, beautiful places and even otherwise. So when we talk about, you know, regulation, when we talk about working to combat this issue, how do you feel can the tourism industry be regulated? Pakistan is one of the most beautiful tourist spots, uh, you know, in the in the world. So, uh, as you've seen recently, you know, uh, uh, Pakistan's number has gone up, you know, in tourism. So by six places. Uh, yeah, by six places. So I would really uh, suggest that you know heavy fines should be imposed on mm. people who are violating, you know, and uh, littering uh, these beautiful places. Mm. And also, uh, you know, police should be, you know, uh, in place uh, to check these people and find them and make sure that uh, you know uh, you know they're not uh uh, doing harassment with the right. local people. Right. And I think at the end of the day, which something which goes back to the basics as well, is that we need to educate people about the implications of doing the same. Again, which takes me to the fact that when we talk about awareness, I think the role of media here is extremely important. Definitely. So how do you feel can media play that role? Because media, as we all know, is of course divided into different categories. We have the electronic media, we have the print media, and now we have the ever booming social media too. Yeah. So how do you feel? What kind of campaigns do we need to have? What kind of talk shows do we need to have? What kind of documentaries can we have in order to propagate, you know, awareness on this very issue? The media is going to play a very critical role in uh, informing the masses, the people, the tourists, everyone, you know, because uh, media is like, uh, you know, is the thing, social media is the thing of, of the time right now. You know, everybody's involved into social media, you know. Uh, the TV is such a, uh, mm -hmm. the, the national TV is mm -hmm. such a big source of spreading awareness. So I think it should be used in a very proper way and uh, in a very systematic way and talks and, uh, uh, you know, documentaries should be more uh, easily available on these sources. Right. And I think in social media in this regard, we do see a lot of climate change activists. They have been using this uh, platform very constructively. Climate March. That exactly. Yeah. The climate march and just like we had many other manches. So I think at the end of the day, all of them have that role to play, but they need to do it in a constructive manner. Constructive so coming way. to you, I think considering that you are, you do belong uh, to academia on the panel today, a very relevant question to ask you before we conclude today's show is that what role do you feel can educationists like yourself play, especially when it comes to, you know, preparing people, especially when it comes to sensitizing young minds mm -hmm. about, you know, climate change, because I at least feel from somebody who looks at this from an outward angle that, you right. know, even though we are educating, you know, university students, this is something which must start at a primary level. Right. Well, academics primarily have two main roles here. So mm. the first one is as researchers. Mm. Their role is to, of course, generate evidence. Mm. And that evidence will then, ha you know, they have to take that evidence to policymakers and then somehow get policymakers to translate that evidence or whatever is suggested by that evidence into concrete policy so that we can address both climate change and environmental issues. Hmm. Then, as you've rightly pointed out, our second role is as teachers. Hmm. Um, but by the time, so, we, so I'm a university teacher, so hmm. we do offer courses on climate change hmm. and on the environment at, at, you know, at, 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 at my university. Right. Uh, but as you've rightly pointed out, a lot of this education has to start much earlier. Right. And specifically in, you know, in, in, in primary school, hmm. Um, and so kids become sensitized to these issues. And much this is something earlier. which is not alien because at the end of the day, we do see other social issues being taught to children, especially you know issues like maybe domestic violence, about you know their own bodily changes, and so many other things at a very basic level. So why not this particular issue that way? And I think in this regard, not you know only with reference to inculcating it or incorporating it in the syllabus itself. I think teachers like yourself also have this very you know kind of an insight inspirational role here that you know you can pass that interest down because I remember as a student that a lot of times 
things that I wasn't interested in just because I had a good teacher or somebody who I was able to interact with well had that power and influence over me, they could get me interested in things which I was maybe otherwise not interested in. Right. So part of it is that it requires behavioral change. So that's mm -hmm. why teachers are important because they pick up these ideas, uh, uh, pick up these concepts mm -hmm. either in school or in university mm -hmm. and then they become habit forming or they translate into some sort of behavioral change. Mm -hmm. uh, but this works for particular kind of issues, for example, sustainable water conservation at the household uh, or you know, the way, just the way you use water in your homes, whether mm. you like wash your cars that often, whether you like grow lavish lawns, mm. etc. Mm. But when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, which no, of is course, a function of course, of that is a bigger problem. Air pollution. Yes. But so this behavioral least, uh, change is very difficult to uh, uh, to to manage. Right. Uh, so, but but but, but you but can take small steps in the right direction, absolutely. and of course, absolutely. if we all do that, then that can bring about positive change. But also training a new cohort of uh. of environmentalists and environmental scientists mm. and environmental economists and that's a big role that I think right. our universities are playing and hopefully as these students graduate and get more advanced degrees and hopefully come back if they're abroad mm. I think we'll have like a sizable uh, cohort of uh, specialists and right. experts who can who who can help who us understand the subject and better. who can comment on it in a very informed yeah. manner right sir your point is noted on which i'll come to you Merunisa, and coming towards the conclusion of the show i think we must talk about this of course uh, you know in terms of a global issue and when we talk about it as a global issue we need to have global solutions too so when we talk about this you know from the um, you know perspective of uh, developed countries helping out developing countries something which we were earlier discussing as well what kind of you know assistance can we actually seek especially when it comes to technology and you know especially when it comes to you know other um, um, kind of initiatives be it in terms of finance schemes for that matter because at the end of the day I feel that the onus of course is more heavily placed on those countries which are the highest emitters. Um, so I think uh, they, there have been pledges made by uh, some developing uh, some of the developed countries already that they're going to inject 100 billion dollars into ensuring that mm. uh, developing countries meet their uh, targets for greenhouse emission um, reductions, etc. Mm. Um, but I think there's a greater need for uh, technology sharing, information sharing, um, sharing resources, research, and also I think there needs to be some sort of global concerted effort where there is dialogue taking place mm. between key stakeholders um, from each country you know mm -hmm. um, and where you really are viewing uh, climate change tackling climate change as a collective rather than uh, bl putting the blame on one country or you mm -hmm. know putting the blame on mo uh, bordering countries mm -hmm. we all need to accept you should not play politics over it yes exactly and I think um, another thing is that most developing countries are actually agrarian based economies mm -hmm. um, so they have the most to lose so mm -hmm. food insecurity is a very of course. real and when crisis. climate change hits them it hurts them worse as opposed it hits to them other worse. countries and yes. a lot of developing countries are also conflict regions so mm -hmm. for example in um, northwest Africa because of desertification um, Al-Qaeda for example was able to increase mm. their recruitment right so when you have a food insecurity um, and when you have it people actually who threatens are, the peace of the region it threatens too, the right. peace of the region and those communities become more vulnerable to mm. all kinds of exploitation and conflict and a disaster and conflict so of course and disaster, I think this comes exactly. back to the main thing that we were earlier discussing that when we talk about you know environment when we talk about air pollution climate change for that matter it has to be seen not just as an environmental issue it has to be seen as a social issue as an economic issue as a political as issue as a class issue as a class issue, as a so class issue too at the end of yeah. the day your point is noted on which note I would like to conclude today's show thank you so much for being here with us today well to conclude today's show we generally spoke about the issue of climate change about air pollution and environmental issues so to speak as they do exist not only in Pakistan but world over we also spoke about the fact that you know if we want to actually uh, combat all these issues more so climate change because it is one of the most pressing challenges that we all you know face globally we need to not only have more comprehensive policies we need to implement the policies that we actually have and in this regard we also need to make little you know changes in our lifestyle which are more mindful and which are more friendly uh, towards the environment uh, so hoping that we'll all work towards a more sustainable future together because we have to save the planet today this is the imminent need of the hour on that note, signing off for today. Until next time, take care and Allah Hafiz.